Good morning, and I uh, want to thank the organizers for inviting me, uh, inviting us. And Amy could have given this talk as well, because she's involved in the analysis, but she's a little less comfortable with lung function uh, as an outcome than uh, a preterm birth. So I'm going to talk about exposure to traffic-related air pollution and decreased lung function in children, uh, a little bit about polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the pollutant uh, that we studied in this analysis. Uh, talk a little bit about our previous uh, results from the Fresno Asthmatic Children's Environment Study faces, and uh, then show you the results of a preliminary analysis uh, with regard to pH and lung function that uh, was a little bit surprising to us but in terms of the strength of the association, and that's part of the reason I want to share it with you. So. Exposure to traffic has been associated with reduced lung function in children. And to my right uh, is one of the co-authors of probably the best study in this regard, the Children's Health Study, uh, published in 2007, a traffic and lung function uh, paper that many of you know. I think it's a seminal paper in this regard. But other groups, including our own, have found similar effects. Um, there's an Oslo birth cohort paper that was published in 2008. We published in 2009 a cross-sectional study upon entry into the Fresno Asthmatic Children's Environment Study. Um, we found baseline spirometry to be associated with uh, distance from roadway. Uh, and then there's a Swedish birth cohort that was recent, a study that was recently published. And just this week, I believe a Chinese uh, cohort was uh, published as well. So again, there's a lot of data connecting air pollution exposure with decreased lung function in kids. We were, we have been in our Children's Environmental Health Center interested in particular in polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, in part because Catherine Hammond and Elizabeth Noth in our group are particularly interested in this pollutant. And uh, there's a fair amount of evidence that, you know, pHs might be a particular part of the traffic mix that's uh, fairly toxic, uh, especially with regard to inducing oxidative stress. So this uh, slide shows a number of the PAHs. And I, the point I want to make here is that the smaller PAHs with just a couple rings uh, tend to be volatile. And then as you get more and more rings, you go to a semi-volatile uh, state. And then the larger uh, ringed PAHs uh, are particle bound. So we've done and published several studies with regard to uh, estimated pH exposure to four, five, and six member rings, pHs. Uh, we published last year a paper associating increased risk of wheezing with this exposure. And then uh, Kari Nadeau, one of our colleagues from Stanford, uh, a pediatric immunologist, has really done some excellent work. I presented it last year at uh, the OHEA-sponsored Children's Environmental Health uh, Symposium, where we have showed impaired regulatory T-cell function in kids exposed to pHs from Fresno compared to kids with low pH exposure who live in Palo Alto. Uh, and there was increased asthma severity associated with the pH exposure. So the specific research question uh, that we wanted to answer was does chronic exposure to pHs primarily derived from traffic emissions? So this is Fresno, and uh, in Fresno, uh, we feel that most of the pH exposure, the ambient pH exposure, is from traffic. How, does that adversely affect lung function in children? And you can see the uh, easy one spirometer that we uh, use there. So. This is a different population than our FACES cohort. The previous two studies that where we associated pH exposure with asthma outcomes was this original Fresno Asthmatic Children's Environment Study cohort. This is now a CHAPS cohort. Um, and we recruited kids basically between 10 and 16 of age with and without asthma. And we recruited them primarily through the Fresno schools. We had about 400 that had spirometry. Uh, and then we geocoded their residents to assign pH 4, 5, 6 exposure. And this is a land use regression model that's grounded in 
actual measurements of pH at a, the central site in the uh, center of Fresno, uh, where there was ongoing monitoring of pHs from 2000 to 2008. And then we did, in quotes, intensive monitoring, two-week pH monitoring at 83 homes for a year, 2002 to 2003. And then the model also includes meteorology and other spatial variables like land use, uh, green space, et cetera. So the analysis I'm about to show you involves the 244 kids who had both good quality spirometry and where we could estimate four or five pH, four, five, six exposure with confidence. Just wanted to show you a map of pH, four, five, six cumulative exposure over this 12 month period, 2002 to Actually, it's a, over a 12-month period during 2000 and 2008. Uh, I guess it looks like it's, it was 2002 to 2003. And the larger circles, the larger circles mean more PAH exposure. And so basically we can create a surface, and we can assign most kids in Fresno uh, to a, a PAH exposure. There's a lot on this slide. Uh, this is showing the 244 in total, and then stratified by asthma status. And what this slide shows is that the asthmatic kids were more black. Uh, they were from uh, poor homes, uh, and there was uh, less, more renting. So basically, lower socioeconomic status and greater African American ethnicity. So. This slide is starting to show, well, this is to show you that uh, the distribution of our lung function results. So the PP is percent predicted. So that includes uh, age, height, and race. These are N. Haynes uh, predicted values. Uh, and not surprisingly, the asthmatic uh, kids had lower lung function than the non-asthmatic kids. But basically, there's not severe abnormalities in, in lung function here. This is the distribution of the pH exposure. One week averages, one month averages, three months, six months, one year prior to the lung function testing being done. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of difference in the means, but as you'd expect, with the shorter averages, there's greater variability. And as also you'd expect, the longer term averages are correlated and the shorter term averages are correlated. And here, uh, I'm starting to show you the actual results. These are percent predicted again. So we didn't adjust for age, height, uh, sex, or race, because the percent predicted values are already adjusted for those. Um, but it's still a relatively crude analysis. There are no socioeconomic status variables, for example. And um, you can see that there was a pretty strong effect for the longer term averages of pH. So this is percent predicted. So for the year prior to the lung function testing, there was a, actually a 5% lower uh, lung function value expected uh, for each nanogram per uh, meter cubed of pH. So uh, given that the average was about three, that's a 15% lower lung function for high pH exposure. So uh, this is now stratified for asthma and, and non-asthma. And while there might be a little effect with the asthmatics, it's certainly not statistically significant. Uh, so the effect is really for FEV1, forced exploratory volume in one second, how much air you can blast out uh, after a deep breath in one second. Uh, and it's it's really in the non-asthmatic kids. We, this was somewhat surprising to us. We have many more non-asthmatic than asthmatic kids, so this might be a power issue. Uh, and we're trying to, we actually have the ability to have more asthmatic kids, uh, and we're currently working on that. We can, we can add another 70 asthmatic kids uh, to the analysis. And then we did an adjustment for five socioeconomic status variables. Low income, so that's less than $15,000 a year annual income, so it's really poor. Uh, and low maternal education, uh, paternal education, 
whether people rent their homes or not, and secondhand tobacco smoke exposure. So basically, after this adjustment for socioeconomic status, there wasn't a big change in the p-value. So we feel that there's not a lot of confounding of these results at this point. Uh, and then, just to make sure, we did the analysis with absolute values as opposed to percent predicted. So percent predicted values, again, have age, height, race, and sex. So we did the absolute values, analysis of the absolute values, and then we added uh, the terms I just mentioned back in, and uh, basically got the same results as the percent predicted. Um, and everything goes the expected direction. Uh, males have better lung function than uh, females. Older kids, taller kids, and black kids have lower lung function for a given age, height, and sex. So in summary, um, we feel in Fresno that traffic emissions are the major source of pH exposures. Um, it, they're not the only source. Tobacco smoke con contains pH. Uh, wood burning is actually an a, a important source of pHs. Uh, diet, especially uh, grilled foods. Uh, but still, we ex traffic is probably the biggest single contributor to pH, uh, ambient pH, pH exposure. And so among Fresno children, estimated exposure to pH four, five, six member rings was associated with decreased lung function. And the effect was pretty big. It was 144 milliliters of FEV1 per nanogram per meter cubed of pH four, five, six. And so far, the effect looks like it's mainly in it in non-asthmatic kids, which might see, seem counterintuitive. But my hand-waving explanation is that uh, with controlled ex human exposures to diesel exhaust, actually more effect has been seen in non-asthmatics than, these are adults, non-asthmatics than asthmatics. Um, the reason potentially being that because asthma is associated with persistent airway inflammation, there may be defense mechanisms that are upregulated that may protect uh, against the effects of uh, uh, pHs. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.